Welcome back to the APSCC 2021 webinar series. I'm Christopher Slaughter, your MC for the series. Today, the subject is the maritime communications industry. A look back at what happened in 2020, look forward to 2021, uh, how the COVID-19 crisis has affected the industry. Obviously, uh, there's been a lot of effect, particularly in the cruise industry, um, but otherwise the, the shipping industry um, it's still moving forward and still has communication needs. And look closer at what's going on in that. Uh, the conversation today is led by Alan Gottlieb from Satellite Mobility World. Uh, you'll hear more about that publication in just a minute, <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, also joining us, Peter Broadhurst from Inmarsat, uh, Cheng Yu Tang from Intellion, and Tom Choi from Airspace Internet Exchange. Tom, of course, a, a veteran of the Asian satellite industry uh, and always a welcome uh, participant in APSCC discussions. Unfortunately, he's going to have to leave a little bit early. So before the conversation uh, quite wraps up, I think we'll be, uh, we'll be losing Tom uh, as part of that conversation. But that's for later on. First up, Alan Gottlieb, take it away. Welcome to APCSC's uh Maritime VSAT session. I'm Alan Gottlieb and I'm editor of Satellite Mobility World. If you haven't read our publication, we're read in 45 countries around the world and we're noted as a, an authority on some of, especially on some of the more controversial topics within the maritime satellite industry. Today, we're going to talk about a variety of topics not, uh, especially things like the COVID crisis, the impact of it on the maritime satellite industry. What's happening in terms of tra transitions of the traditional business model? What are the effects of bandwidth oversupply, teleport oversupply, and the emergence of new sources of bandwidth from LEOs and MEOs? We're going to talk about antennas and the changes in those particular areas. And we're going to talk about the technologies that are affecting the, the industry. We're going to touch on artificial intelligence. We're going to talk about, uh, and we're going to talk about IOTs. And we're also going to pay special attention to both the cargo and cruise markets in maritime. So to start off, oh, also too, I'd like to invite anyone that's not on, on the Satellite Mobility World, LinkedIn, uh, Maritime VSAT, uh, Independent Opinions, uh, LinkedIn group, to sign up for that, we have over 5,300 members on that particular group on LinkedIn. With, <coughs> excuse me, with that, I'm going to ask, we have uh, three panelists who are very well known in the industry. Peter Broadhurst uh, from uh, Inmarsat, who uh, has a long and well-known career in the maritime satellite uh, world. Tom Choi, who uh, everyone knows so well, uh, who was former CEO of ABS and is one of the best known entrepreneurs and uh, disrupting guys in the satellite industry. And uh, we have Chen Yu from one of my favorite companies in the technology area, which is Intellion, which Intellion has done some remarkable things in the satellite antenna market. And uh, we're looking to, uh, forward to hearing from Chen Yu. So I'm going to turn a, a little bit of introduction to each of the, allow a little bit of introduction to each, uh, for each one of our panelists. Uh, why don't we start with Peter? Uh, why don't you give a short little brief on your background, uh, even though everyone knows you so well, probably. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Uh, I like the way you refer to my long career in <laughs> the industry. Uh, I am one of the older boys, I guess. Um, so, uh, yes, I'm currently the um, senior vice president of um, uh, safety and security and looking after the cruise and passenger section of uh, Inmarsat Maritime. I've been with Inmarsat for six years or just over six years, I'm uh, coming up to my seventh year now. Um, I'm an ex-radio officer. I went to sea when uh, communications was all about Morse keys and, and tapping a uh, Morse key. So I've seen the evolution of um, lots of generations of uh, different satellite services uh, and communication systems uh, through that. Um, I'm now looking at developing the next generation of uh, safety services and building that proposition for cruise, ferries and the yachting sector within Inmarsat. Thank you. Uh, Tom? Thanks, Alan. Hi, I'm Tom Choi. I'm the uh, 
founder and chairman of Airspace Internet Exchange. Uh, we currently have uh, two technologies that we're developing. Uh, one's called Curvalux. It's a multi-beam phase array antenna system uh, that's terrestrially uh, providing extremely high capacity wireless broadband services. It's uh, commercially shipping today uh, and, and adopted by, uh, let's say, mobile operators and wireless ISPs. And the other business that we have is Saturn Satellite Networks. We're based in California, uh, building a, a novel form of uh, small satellites for uh, geo as well as uh, constellations. Uh, I'm not really a maritime expert, but uh, I'm an entrepreneur. I, I founded Speedcast, uh, which, as everybody knows, is a, a very large maritime operator. And uh, I, was, uh, I was also previously uh, running ABS, uh, which is a global satellite operator with seven satellites around the world. So I, I'm hoping to contribute to this conversation from a field of uh, satellite operations, satellite services, technology, antennas, and, uh, and a global perspective on where I see technologies uh, evolving and where I see uh, customers, uh, you know, uh, their attention span as well as their adoption uh, evolving into, you know, different avenues of adoption in terms of technologies and services. Okay. Uh, Chen Yu. Sure. I can uh, yeah, give several words. <laughs> um, I'm uh, in, in charge of Asia Pact for uh, Intellion, which is uh, very much focused on the, uh, you know, innovation and uh, well, as well as the uh, uh, ILT kind of a hardware infrastructure solution. Um, for the connectivity. And I think uh, previously, definitely a bit in this uh, second business, along with Peter, not as uh, seasoned enough as his, but, uh, you know, served for the same kind of uh, uh, space of uh, second connectivity for the past eight years. And previously, I think, you know, my background is uh, mainly in the telco business. And this is, I think that, uh, you know, uh, with a very open kind of a trend, what we can see is really genuine convergence between what, what the uh, uh, wireless network will be evolving into 5G and 6G and with the satellite connectivity. And hopefully we can, you know, all see in the, as an ecosystem later on how we can provide more value added services and also data density kind of uh, uh, applications to the end user, whether on the shore and on the vessel. So okay. very happy to be here. All right, thank you very much. Now we're going to dig into some of the more critical questions that are going on in the industry right now. Uh, I think what I wanna do is I wanna start with talking about cruise and cargo markets. What's the effect of COVID when are they going to recover? Are there problems with the installation of equipment based on delays associated with COVID? What's the outlook for those? Uh, part of my understanding is that the vessels are still connected and down to about half bandwidth uh, in order to save as much money on uh, services as possible. So why don't we start, you guys, Cheng Yu, you're an expert on the cruise market and Telian has gotten probably 50% of its revenues from those excellent tri-band antennas. Tell us what's going on with those, uh, with the installations, the acceptance of your tri-bands, how that's growing, and uh, what you see in terms of uh, the future of cruise. And of course, Peter, uh, I'll let you, you're free, of course, free, and any of the other folks are free to chime in after Chen Yu finishes. Why don't you go ahead, sure. Chen Thanks very much for uh, to give me the mic. Um, I think for Intellion, uh, we definitely we've been you know in pioneer in the tri band to provide a connectivity, ubiquitous connectivity for the passengers on the cruise ship. Although I think the cruise industry w during the pandemic situation has been put on a hot halt, um, but I think definitely the the essence of the connectivity will actually be more intensified because everyone with the lockdown, not only passenger uh, vessels, but if we look at a cargo and so on, they, they are thrivingly you know, growing uh, in terms of the demand. So connectivity itself is 
uh, been intensified during our pandemic situation. Second okay. of all is due in the cruise industry, I would say uh, because of you have a density of a passenger, uh, 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 you know, urge for the for both connectivity and also application, how to balance, uh, you know, the time as well as the, uh, the different connectivity type. It's really provide operators, and I think Peter would have probably more insights from a, a upstream operator point of view to see how what a kind of a value added services that's required. But as infrastructure solution provider, what we needed to provide is beyond the robustness and how to provide so called intelligent uh, um, traffic allocations as well as the uh, so we call the orchestra to make sure that in any time, in any kind of a bursty uh, uh, customer traffic, it will be well served with limited or with the, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, reasonable hardware, the number of the hardware on ship. So I think that uh, with the industry will come back, plus the other passenger uh, uh, connectivity is required in the, in the passenger vessels. We see a, a strong surge in the coming years to come. That will be my take. Could you focus just a little bit tighter on the difference? How much, how, how badly has the cargo market been hit compared to the cruise market? I've heard that it hasn't suffered too much. Is that true? Well, my view, uh, once again, uh, we, we, from a hardware perspective, on the contrary, I think the pandemics uh, 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 reversely endorsed the needs for the cargo, cargo let's say, uh, um, demands. And we actually see in the commercial shipping actually is actually keeping a very rigorous kind of a, 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 a pace of the growth. Um, and, and I think the challenge right now is more on the, you know, the, the, with all the lockdown, how to bring the new goods that coming to, you know, into the ports to be installed. But, once again, this could be also a, a formidable opportunity because of the, the uh, uh, um, with all the geographic kind of a lockdown, we needed to embrace a more, uh, let's say, um, ecosystem collaborations and also service network agility and so on. So from a cargo uh, demands perspective, from the hardware perspective, we see actually there is a growth. Okay, so you say that's better than what... The situation in cargo is much better than it is in cruise. Is that what you're saying? Definitely. Now, I'm also very much keen to hear what Peter uh, uh, point from operator perspective, because definitely Imaset is one of the heavy gun in the you know geo stationary uh, service pro uh, as a service provider. Yeah, Peter, why don't you tell us? You have you probably have a very good perspective on the cargo market since I don't. Since uh, that's been in Marsat, it's pretty much the biggest focus of in Marsat. What what do you see is going on in the cargo market versus the cruise market? Um, can you can, can you uh, give us some points on the differentiation you're seeing and the effect of the COVID epidemic and the and the speed of recovery and how these two sectors differ? Yeah, I mean, the, the, you're, you're quite right. The two sectors are, are completely different. So um, uh, following on from Cheng Yu's comments, the, the commercial or merchant or cargo market, as you said, um, has been very resilient. Um, at the beginning of this year, when um, a lot of uh, Asia was, uh, the ports were, were closing down, they, they obviously went through quite a, um, a, a bit of a struggle. But they bounce back really quickly, and and over the year, I would say that um, our our forecast for the year in terms of what we thought we would do has, has been met, just about met. So uh, overall, the amount of bandwidth that's been consumed, the amount of um, systems that we've installed uh, has been on a par. So you can see how that you know the the free goods have been traveling around the world. I don't think anybody in, in any country has suffered from not having any any kind of uh, food or commodity or whatever it's the the, the actual channels have been kept open by a, an extremely robust and resilient industry um i'm not saying that industry hasn't suffered it's been it's been pulled apart uh, quite hard and uh, and obviously the crew 
have, have suffered quite considerably in, in doing that the job. They, they should be commended for what they've done in, in that respect. But um, it does show how you know how shipping is quite resilient and uh, and, and done a very good job and bounce back extremely quickly. I've heard um, that part of the, oh, excuse me. I've heard that part of that is that it, that uh, tours of duty on these vessels have been extended. And for that reason, uh, that ship owners and managers have uh, gravitated toward providing a lot more uh, connectivity, bandwidth, and resources to help ease the strain of that extended the extended tours that these people are facing. Have you seen that? We have. Yeah, we've seen it increased in um, connectivity to vessels, uh, as, and predominantly for crew. Uh, to allow them to to um, to call home and be um, you know in touch with their their loved ones and finding out what's going on in the world. Um, you know, some obviously some shipping companies are better than others at doing that. But yeah, we've also put our own initiatives in place right at the beginning. We um, we had a very big crew support as long uh, as well as a as a COVID um, nineteen helpline, a free helpline to to support uh, crew. Uh, and um, and we support all that kind of mental well-being or whatever because some of these crew members have been at sea for a long, long time. And um, and it, in, in a case, it's not the case of a problem for the you know the shipping companies trying to repatriate them, but um, you know there's no flights or they can't they can't uh, um, get off in the country where they they should get a flight, etc. And you've got to realise that for every crew member that's on a ship, there's also a crew member ashore that's trying to get on a ship and. If they don't get on a ship, they don't get paid. So they're they're suffering as well. So the the, the industry, as I say, has, has has gone through quite a tough time. Um, we've worked with a lot of charities and all, uh, to, to try and you know overcome this. It, it's the same thing, you know. With um, now we're looking at vaccinations for everybody, but who's going to vaccinate the 1.6 million crew members <laughs> that are on ships going around the world? Because they are essential people keeping this this. Uh, it's a good going. point. Very very interesting. Uh, it is so, so uh, we do need to you know we all need to play our part um in terms of shipping and and uh, you know but, but shipping has suffered you know some of the container companies are, are struggling to find empty containers because they've shipped containers and the, <laughs> i think some of them don't really know where they are now <laughs> um because they've just you know have to manage to keep things going so it, it will take a little bit of time to, to settle down but i i suspect that commercial shipping will continue uh, on a strong um uh, trajectory and um it follows a cycle of recession uh, normally uh, you know it's it's, it's it's although in the, the last number of years it's, it's kind of been fluctuating a little bit weirdly but um if the world it, it depends on what the economy does now you know after, after this and how fa- fast we, we we bounce back and if we have a boom and bust or whatever it happens so but shipping will always be there it's a very strong industry and um uh, a bit like the satellite industry, it'll, it'll always be there. It's a case of who makes the money in it. <laughs> it just it just varies around. It moves around. Peter, um, on, on the cruise industry, I I I'd just like to pick up on that point that they obviously cargo there is people uh, and people couldn't travel, and um, so we saw a lot of the cruise ships either suspend their service um, completely and rely on very low bandwidth data just to effectively put the the ship in hot standby very close to port uh, here where i am in the in the uk in southampton ships were coming in spending one or two days in the port and then uh, the cruise ships one or two days in the port putting all the new uh, food and 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 uh, cleaning the, the vessel and then going back out to anchor for two to three weeks and repeating that cycle so so that they didn't actually go into service Others suspended and, and tried to offer some services and whatever. That You've seen one or two cruise ships try to come back. Um, we're members of uh, CLIA, the cruise, cruise Line Industry Association. They're pretty bullish that they believe that, you know, because people have been locked down and been, been kind of um, restricting what they can do, that the industry will bounce back at, very quickly when, it, when, it, when, it, when people can travel and can get on vessels. But uh, it's, you know, it, it is a bit of a... Uh, a waiting game as to when that date will come but um the, i believe the cruise industry is ready to go and um and as soon as uh, some of those restrictions get lifted then we will see the um cruises from leaving one country and returning to a country um uh, it's the same country and then as we expand they'll be they'll be doing wider and further afield ones 
So tell us, uh, how, I'm sorry, tell us how things are going with Fleet Express. Uh, if I remember last time, it was something like 4,000 installations. How's that going? And are you experiencing problems due to COVID for installing antennas? So um, we are um, just about to announce that we've hit 10,000 installations. 10,000. Wow. 10,000 installations. Marvelous. Experience. So, um, um, yeah, it's, um, it's going extremely well, to be quite honest. Um, and, um, you know, uh, over the, the kind of four, four years or so that we've been really engaged in this and, 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 and moving forward, uh, I think, you know, we've surprised a lot of people in the way that we've managed to infiltrate that market and, 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 and do what we do. Um, we've expanded the portfolio a little bit more with what we call Crew Express, which is, uh, you know, a, um, a kind of a portal for um, managing traffic on board the vessel. So that we're taking away some of those um, issues around um, putting pin codes and things like that for crew members and whatever. So, so it, it, the portfolio is expanding. We've, we've got a data play, so fleet data. Um, connecting ships with IoT, which I know is a subject you're going to, you're going to talk about. Um, we have charter plans now for secondary for, on the oil rigs for, for that. Um, we have our own cybersecurity. So we've gone down that managed service line in terms of um, trying to take some of the, I'd say, the, the kind of um, complexity out of it. Uh, it's easier to install. A network will support 60 centimeter antennas. Um, so, uh, on a global basis, so so um, yeah, it's it's our penetration has been it's been it's been really yeah. done really well, and and the customers are, are are really starting to move more and more data, uh, and I would think for the first time we're really seeing that what we call the digital revolution starting to to occur. Okay, terrific. Next thing I'd like to talk about is is the Leo versus Geo issue. And whether or not we're going to see massive adoption of G of Leo and Mio technology in the maritime business, or do we think that geos are going to retain the uh, majority of the market share in the maritime side? Um, so that's a. Uh, I want to bring Tom first in, uh, give him a chance to to express his thoughts on that since he knows these technologies very well. Tom, you want to talk about whether you think Leos and Mios are going to have a significant impact on the maritime industry? Yeah, thanks, thanks Alan. Um, I, I think if you look at the current maritime industry, it, it's, rough, it's slightly higher than uh, 2 billion a year. And uh, you add the maritime um, mobile satellite service market with the FSS market, uh, then the maritime market uh, rough, roughly represents about 15% of the global uh, satellite communications market. Uh, so that's a very important part of the market. And it's it's a market that's not subject to competition from terrestrial. So fiber optic cables rolling out in the central part of Africa, you know, South America, 5G rolling out into, you know, various suburban areas, it's not going to impact uh, demand for satellite communications. And, uh, and the growth of uh, data and internet traffic is going to also, you know, on land is going to translate to more demand for data and ships, especially in cruises. I think if you look at uh, the current um, cruise market or prior to the pandemic, the, the, the major cruise ships uh, or the carriers, operators, were planning to expand uh, the number of ships from, I think, 200 to 400, very, very large vessels. And uh, their, their demand for data was growing from like a couple hundred megabits to at least one gigabit. Uh, I think if the cruise market does come back, uh, within a few years, you could be looking at 500 plus ships needing uh, one gigabit each. So, so, so the maritime market is a very important part of the satellite communications market. It's a protected market that's not subject to terrestrial competition. So it's an important market for the in industry, especially for FSS operators. But 
It's also a market which is very easily taken, could be taken by LEO, low earth orbit operators, because their satellites are much closer to the earth uh, so that not only do they have an advantage in terms of, of delay, you know, let's say lower latency, which is, you know, what they've been touting, but because of the relative distance, uh, you know, 500 kilometers to 1500 kilometers of low Earth orbit satellites being much closer than 33,000, 34,000 kilometers, uh, you you have a what's called an RF, you know, space loss gain. So that with a much lower powered satellite, they can deliver a much higher throughput to a smaller antenna because it's just the, it's just physics. Uh, antennas are much closer. So I, I would say that the LEO satellite operators have the potential of uh, being a big threat to geo operators because at least on land, when you have buildings, trees, mountains, structures, it, it could get in the way of, of, a, of a high quality operations of a low earth orbit satellite network. But, but in the middle of the ocean, you don't have those obstructions so uh so i think it's you know whether it, it's a mobility market above the clouds or be below the clouds in the ocean uh leo satellite operators could have if they have the right technology with interconnects isls and they have the right frequencies that are capable of closing the links with the existing antennas that are on board the ships uh, I, I do believe where, you know, I've been traditionally a big doubter of LEO broadband for consumer broadband and terrestrial broadband, but for at least maritime and aeronautical mobility, I think, I think they represent a big threat. Let me ask you this, Tom. We really, of course, are talking about two markets here. One of them is the cruise. And uh, of course, in that market, we're dealing, as we all know, with a very intensive demand for bandwidth. It's going crazy. And in that market, of course, that what you're talking about, it seems to make a lot of sense what you're saying in terms of uh, the, the antenna technology, the resources you're gonna need to work with LEOs. But now on the in the cargo market where you're only dealing, as you may know, uh, a typical cargo ship might only be using less than a megabit uh, on downstream and 500K on the upstream, and that might be even more than they're using. Of course, because as you know, there are only 25 people roughly on a cargo ship. So do you see the effect of LEOs also in the cargo market? And of course, this also ties into my next question of the antennas that you're going to need to track these things. Uh, on a cruise ship, they may be practical in a large in a market like that. But in a, on a cargo market with only 25 people, you begin to wonder, is it really going to be worth the the cargo people shifting to LEOs? Well, if you, if you look at the cases, uh, Starlink and OneWeb, neither one of those constellations have inter-satellite links today. So they're not going to be able to give global connectivity on oceans. It's They're not going to be able to put ground gateways where, there no, where there's no ground, where there's no fiber. So those systems will not play a role at all in the, in the cargo space, unless it's regional or domestic. Right. Um, global cargo uh, space, I, I don't think they're gonna play, play any kind of a role. Uh, but I, I, I do believe that, uh, you know, as chips get very smart, uh, you have intelligent devices that are communicating machine to machine, IoT, uh, you have other constellations that are launching by other smaller companies, new startups that do have satellite connectivity, ISLs, and then they will be able to provide, you know, smart machine-to-machine -machine communications, IoT, and then they, they would also pose a threat to geo operators. Well, that would be people like Telesat, right? Telesat's got a, a, a constellation that's really structured for enterprise with optical links and much larger, more powerful satellites. So might they be the, turn out to be the big player 
Of course, we don't know what Amazon's going to do, of course, but might they turn out to be the big potential player in maritime because of the more powerful satellites and the links? Uh, I think if you're going to serve the, the cargo market, you're going to need ISLs, inter-satellite links. Okay. And, you know, Starlink says that they're going to have ISLs, and I'm sure they're investing money into free space optics. And uh, I'm sure the second generation one web satellites will have them too. So this is not going to be just belonging to Telesat. And, you know, those systems that I mentioned are funded. They've launched satellites. Telesat has yet to start. Maybe they'll get there. But when they get there, so so Starlink as well as OneWeb and everybody else. So, so you're we, saying really it's because these folks don't have satellite, inter-satellite links, OneWeb or Starlink, that we're looking at a, a ways before these Leos can really make an impact in that mark in the global shipping market. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, this brings us to a very interesting point. And this brings us back to the antenna side. And so I'd like to bring Cheng Yu in this. I know uh, that you folks have a deal with OneWeb where you're using a couple of antennas to, uh, in, uh, to track LEOs. I know also that the Intellian tri-band units also are capable of tracking LEOs. So what are you folks thinking? Uh, number one, are you developing a phased array antenna and what do you what do you see in terms of the uh, the antenna the obstacles in terms of antennas for accommodating these uh, new Leo constellations on in the maritime market? Will it, will you be sticking with largely parabolic antennas and pairs that do tracking, uh, or will we you folks be uh, pushing a new uh, phased array antenna into some of those markets? Thank well, you. I want to say the short answer to your question um, is, Alan, is all the options are on the table. But I just before I get, before I go to a little bit more specific, I wanted to just echo what uh, Tom said earlier. In in our view, from a pure hardware perspective, we want it to be as interoperable and also as open platform as possible. But there is two things that we start to see the satellite industry started to actually evolve um, with the uh, um, uh, you know, more intelligent kind of application trend. One is the, the, the sensitivity on the latency. With all the technology evolvement and so on, people are less and less, let's put it this way, tolerant with the huge latencies that currently in the narrow band they start to see. So the latency, the, you know, improvement will actually drive a lot of openness to the technology. I want to say second of all is uh, I, I very much, uh, you know, whether it's in my set or other, you know, new entrepreneur try to do really focus on the smartness, which means also the total data solutions uh, for entire end, end users, especially on the maritime side. So with, you know, all the data Acquisitions, I mean, from the data acquisitions, data storage and data transfer, um, you know, to all, all those passenger related with the, you know, information requirements that will require a lot of more bandwidth that equivalent to what we see on the land side. Mm -hmm. So with all the technology, wireless technology, as I mentioned earlier, with the 5G and evolving into 6G, the barriers between the, you know, the satellite communication, which currently on the couple of, you know, uh, megabits per second and so on, will move into more, you know, similar to the gigabit. Um, that trend allow us to think what are the different kind of antenna technology, which is required five years down the road. So that's also why I think from our side point of view, uh, with our, uh, um, you know, innovation currently based on the geo uh, constellations, we right. want to be open also to have, uh, you know, we call it XEO type, you know, cross the uh, layer meal and, and, and the geo. So customers will offer the both, you know, value chain and also the operators without changing fundamentally the, uh, the infrastructure but try to take as much as a common sense as possible to evolve with their excellence of the application. Because after all, 
all towards the end user. What is matters is not only the hardware; it is really the enablement of the services and also all the you know variety of the application that will drive the growth. So, you know, if we look at the you know the new technology that's required, especially in the, uh, Leo and the Mail, phase three is definitely one of the uh, you know the 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 uh, the strong kind of a candidates. So. From an Italian point of view, we are looking into all those possibilities. Um, mm -hmm. But I think in the foreseeing future, I will still see that you know parabolic kind of antenna and have uh, some consistencies. Um, you know, it, it will continue to have a strong, let's say, uh, uh, play and market share. Especially, uh, I think on the jail side. Uh, well, Peter can second much more with internet uh, with Imasat's i six plan, right? So this is where also the you know L band reliability will marry with the uh, you know the GX type of uh, you know the data uh, um, data broadband and how to you know to provide the uh, it, it's, um, data safety as well I mean reliability with the uh, broadband. This is also you know the the interesting trend uh, you know in in the traditional commercial shipping that will be evolving with the continuity of the technology as well. It yes. is. It, it is both. I think from antenna technology point of view, it will be it will be both you know uh, disruptive and also it, it will be some consistent kind of uh, continuous improvement as well. It's a hybrid. So uh, I, I'd like to agree with that, Alan. You know, um, some of the points Tom made. You know, the maritime industry is a significant satellite user, and it's always going to be a significant satellite user, but. The maritime industry itself is also very conservative. And um, this is a non-regulated field for, for shipping. And non-regulated fields mean I don't have to fit it. And, I, you know, I built my ship. It, it's going to last 15 years and there's no need to fit any more uh, parts on this. It just does the job. It's not an easy market to, to churn. So um, satellite technology won't necessarily drive – it won't be the whole kind of uh, – uh, panacea of, of change. It has to be the commercial model. It has to be, as, as, as uh, Chang Yu said, around the applications. What are the what are what is it going to um, allow to be used, and where does a shipping company get that return on investment through? And, and that obviously is a digital play, an IoT play, or or, or um, uh, uh, definitely a, a kind of smart network solution. So that's what I think we'll, 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 the, the maritime industry will be really looking for. For The fact that there's more operators up there, Leo, Mio, Geo, whatever, is going to offer more bandwidth and more capabilities. So it's, it's going to be a, a very rich environment and um, yeah, very, very interesting times. But, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's very hard for, for new players to, to make – a large scale change in a very short period of time. Peter, let me ask you this then, because we're dealing, let's take for example, these large parabolic antennas that Intellion has been so successful with. As we all know, they have tremendous bandwidth capability and trying to equal that with a phased array antenna in terms of cost and space for how large you have to make it and all of that. Um, that plus what you just mentioned, the reluctance of people to want to change, and the fact in the cruise market, we've already talked about the soaring demand for bandwidth. Would phased arrays even be able to satisfy a gigabit of, uh, of demand at a, at a, in a competitive way to, with a, a, a large 2.4 meter parabolic antenna? Are we really talking about pie and pie in the sky with a Phased arrays on a cruise ship, uh, or uh, oh, is yeah. there any possibility? Yeah, it, sometimes we try and um, shoehorn technology in as as the solution. It's not necessarily the solution. <laughs> um, uh, there's nothing wrong with the 2.4 meter antenna from Italian. It, it does the job, <laughs> and it does the job quite 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 well. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah, that wasn't a, uh, an advert for Italian, but it, it, what I'm saying, it, it it does do the job. So, um, is a phased array? You know, is it going to be at the right price point? Is it going to be able to do the same bandwidth? 
face arrays are not really at that point yet. They're, they're for a different market. Uh, and 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 they should build scale in that market before they think about uh, entering the, the the fringe markets. The, the cruise ship industry is a very small industry. Let's face it. As Tom said, it may be five hundred ships in a few years' time, um, yes. I, and and it may not be that the, you know there's a, there's a there's definitely what we've seen in the cruise ships, the middle ships, the the the, the kind of 1,500 1, 1, passenger ships have gone away. And actually, the the real growth now is in the smaller cruise ships. They want to go to the the Antarctic, the Arctic. They want to go Galapagos. They want to go French Polynesia. They want to go those weird, but they don't want to do the Mediterranean and the Caribbean. It's been overdone, and and people don't want to be on a, a ship with four thousand people on it more. So, and, and with COVID, they're probably going to go away from it. So, so that industry is going to change and is going to evolve, but it's always going to be a, a small one. The, the offshore oil and gas industry as well is a big user of, of bandwidth. And, and again, you, you've been in that field for quite a number of years and, 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 and that has its ups and downs uh, in terms of uh, requirements, uh, mainly by the oil price. But, um, but uh, again, they will, they will want to, to use it. And a, a 2.4 meter antenna fits, the, the, the technology is right for it. And again, it's that, that's not a problem they want to try and fix. What they're trying to fix is how do I ensure I get my data off the oil rig or off the cruise for my passengers and provide the service to the level they really want. And if they're going to spend any any dollars in terms of investment, that, that's where that ecosystem is. And if you look at the number of um, startups now in the maritime space, it's incredible. It really is. Um, and and there's, there's a lot of money being put into these startups for, for new applications and, and, and driving um, uh, return on investment for, for shipping across uh, cruise ships and, and, and merchant ships as well. Well, yeah. I would like to add one thing. You know, I mean, uh, on the, I think a bandwidth and I think a novel, novelty of the technology is one thing. But I think if we, you know, tear down into the maritime uh, uh, you know, ecosystem, right? Safety as well as the, the entire kind of IoT reliability. And to get into some of the regulatory in, uh, uh, related uh, data services, including the next generation GMDSS, yes. and also how to get you know, the VDR information in the rescue missions, all those kind of data security. It, it, let's don't forget. I think also one of the key thing right, in the maritime, whether it's uh, you know cruise or you know oil and gas, as well as the uh, uh, commercial shipping. Definitely, this is the fundamental mission of the you know safety, as well as the the ubiquitousness in terms of IoT solution. Marrying the, uh, the the bandwidth along with the safety requirements, I think that is defining kind of a DNA to our industry in the maritime co communication as well. I want to talk it's about not nice to have. Yeah. It is uh, mission critical. Let yeah. me ask you this while I've got you, uh, Ching Yu. As far as you know, obviously, again, we're talking about two different markets when we're talking about cruise and cargo. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, it's hard for me to imagine that on a, a car on a container ship that's got a six uh, 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 a one a one point two meter antenna stabilized antenna with twenty five people on board isn't isn't it wouldn't it be very hard for to displace that with a phased array and go into would 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 uh, like what Peter was saying of course that the shipping industry is so darn conservative. Are you guys thinking that you're actually going to see in those cargo markets some folks replacing uh, the good old proven 1.2 meter stabilized antenna serving 25 people and put in a, a phased array antenna? What do you think? Is that going to happen or are we going to be with conventional parabolic dishes on those, on the, in that market for a long time? Well, I mean, from pure uh, hardware perspective, I would uh, like to use the uh, quote from, uh, you know, Andy Grove, uh, ex-CEO of Intel, only the paranoid can survive. So, you know, all the possibility are there. I mean, definitely there will be some pioneers in the industry will, will, will try the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, flat panel or a phase three to replace the parabolic. But I think the key thing is, once again, whether it's a cruise ship or whether it's a cargo ship with 25 people on it, reliability and the, the data 
integrity as well as a, a safety is primordial. So I think whatever the technology it is and so on, that there is a fundamental underpinning kind of a factor, which is how we provide the data so kind of uh, uh, integrating in whatever the, the CEPCOM uh, data transfer uh, mission. And right now, I would say, you know, phase three is widely used and a common move in the, in the vehicular kind of a communication work very well. I mean, uh, uh, and also on the, uh, on the, on the uh, you know, air, aircraft kind of a, a communication but I think on the maritime, because of the, you know, the, the liberations as well as the ocean uh, so-called uh, wave and so on, how to bring the, the uh, uh, maturity of the face ray into a, a high sea sailing. Um, yeah. You know, this could be a technical kind of a barrier that for all the players to, 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 to face. But before those factors are being duly looked at, I would say for safety related communication and so on, there is still a, 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 a legacy play for majority of the parabolic kind of antenna to enhance the adoption of the IoT solutions for the maritime world. That would be my, let's say that would be my personal projections to see from a hardware perspective. So you think a lot of, leg you're saying that a lot of, Legacy uh, equipment is going to stay in place. I think. Do I? Read I, I would say that will be a gradual migration. If the technology proving the face ray in the maritime will be, you know, uh, uh, will be good enough to actually provide a both, you know, stability as well as the uh, the scale. And I think also the other areas that we have to bear the ship, whether it's a mega cargo or you know, uh, VLCC and so on, you have a limited space as well. So the antenna, compared to parabolic, so on, we also need to look at the what is the dimension that it requires, mm -hmm. and also yeah. what's the NT kind of uh, 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 so-called st stability co consideration will be also very important. Yeah. I want to say the options definitely there, but how long it will take? Well, that will be just you know the uh, quantum leap. Everyone will move into you know from a parabolic into uh, uh, you know state of art. Uh, face ray, I would say that will be a gra gradual kind of adoptions. Mm -hmm. And then we're talking then again about uh, the cargo market specifically. That's correct. Okay. Well, now this really, we, we've, we've talked about a lot of things now. This really gets interesting when we start talking. You all have breached the ideas in some of the conversations regarding IoT. And of course, we know what's going on in that market. I'm sure you folks are all, uh, I don't know if Tom's familiar with it, but uh, the folks in the maritime market are probably familiar with what uh, uh, Kongsberg is doing with their Cognify solution, which essentially is an IoT, for those who are not familiar with it, it's an IoT type of solution where uh, Kongsberg places a server on the vessel collects all of the sensor information from various systems on board the vessel and ships them up into the cloud where they can be analyzed either by the shipping company itself or by a third party company that's employed by the shipping company in order to and use that data in order to improve efficiency of operation on the vessel and perhaps do some predictive maintenance as well. Uh, tra tra which is a valuable thing to do. So my question, but yet that's only a couple of thousand vessels are doing that. So my question is, uh, I'm going to throw it out to you, both you and Peter and the Tom, of course, if he wants to contribute to that, is how fast is this thing going to happen? Are shipping companies really adopting these kinds of, going to adopt these? Are we looking at the beginning of a wave or is this a very slow uh, kind of adoption? Um, would you like to? Would you both like to comment on that? Of course, Tom, too. You're more than welcome to contribute. Peter, you want to shoot first? You are the operator. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, Can you get yeah. these stubborn guys to take a to put in IoT in a big way, Peter. <laughs> uh, it's definitely, it's it's been our it's, it's been our strategy for a number of years. We have a you know a digital play. We've we've created a, a um, the Fleet Express network around the concept of the secondary pipe to keep 
uh, IoT and, um, and, and that data flowing individually. We have a service called Fleet Data. Um, it uh, um, effectively connects the VDR um, to, the, um, to the Fleet Express service. And you can bring a number of tags back, as you say, put it in the cloud, and you can take those tags, um, any, kind of, any kind of data you want, and use them how you want. It can be shared with multiple people, ship manager, ship operator, charterer. All those people can have access to effectively the same data. So ra rather than the old traditional model of five or six different, you know, engine manufacturer bringing his IoT back, the ship bringing some IoT back, just all bring it back in one pipe. And then and then share it in the cloud. Um, we've got uh, hundreds of ships doing that at this moment in time. Um, and then um, alluding to what uh, Cheng Yu said, we put algorithms in there now to to um, to effectively um, sense uh, anomalies for a safety perspective. Um, simple one is, for example, um, the inclinometer is connected to the VDR. The ship is listing at 40 degrees for over a minute or so. That's an anomaly. Somebody should be aware of that. If a ship is speeding along at 12 knots and it goes from 12 knots to zero knots in a matter of seconds, that's an anomaly. It's hit something. There are certain criteria that you can use algorithms to identify a ship that has exceeded some limit. Do you send you alarms go, then? Do you send you alarms? Can, so in fleet, fleet data automated safety, we actually dump the VDR, including the full ECDIS, full ECDIS, and audio off the bridge into the cloud. And that way, you can, that data can be available for um, safety operators anywhere. And the reason we're going down this route, uh, Alan, is because of... Um, if we do go to uh, reduced crew or autonomous ships or whatever we want to call it in the future, safety services don't go away. I know safety is safety of life at sea, but in, in, in an auto autonomous ship may not have any people on board. But the environmental damage that be, can, be, can be caused and the insurance risk and all those kind of things from a ship that is automated. It's uh -huh. still there, still a, still a real risk. So right. we need to have safety services in the future. We need to have reliable safety services which in myself and myself, because I drive the safety strategy, is they need to be more proactive. They need to be in the lines of what's happening in the aviation district, uh, industry with, with GADs, where a, 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 you know, a vessel is identified as an anomaly. It's, it's something we should be reaching out to and helping that ship. If the fire alarm is not answered within so many minutes, there's something wrong on board that ship. Those guys are probably fighting a fire and they haven't got time to raise the alarm. So there's things that we can do that are pr more proactive than what we have today, which most safety services today are reactive. They work and they do save lots of people's lives, but unfortunately still we have uh, far too many fatalities at sea and so we Peter, can improve that. What happens when the, the system detects one of these anomalies? Can you take us through the process? What, who's so notified? Now we, Huh? So obviously this is not a regulated or approved safety service. So we are working with those rescue coordination centers and the search and rescue about how would you want to be notified? And what is the data that you would want to know from that vessel? Because given a full egg dis display to a, a, a rescue coordination center is not the idea. He's not a mariner. mariner. He doesn't know the, what that would do. But if he knew all of the AIS targets on that display, and knew yeah. which was the closest closest vessel to that to the vessel in, in with the anomaly, it will help him coordinate what's going on on the scene. Okay, but now you're talking about an anomaly that may represent a critical, a serious threat to the vessel. Okay, that's what, what about safe, from a safety perspective. What about yeah. other things that are being tracked that need where where uh, someone needs to be notified that aren't. Uh, where the ship isn't in terrible peril, but they are of interest. How do you handle those? They don't go to a re uh, rescue center, obviously. No, no. So, so uh, again, data can be put in a cloud, and pe and people who who are um, interested in that, like ship owners, ship managers, and whatever, can be can just even receive an email to say, by the way, something's been triggered. 
you know, you have had uh, the engine revs have exceeded this or the, um, the, the time running has d- done this or a number of issues that you can, you can proactively um, look at in terms of the management of that vessel. Okay. Well, are you doing anything with uh, predictive maintenance? So Using again, a, a lot of uh, a lot of class societies uh, and even ourselves are moving towards um, effectively virtual um, performance monitoring and, um, and and maintenance schemes. Um, you know, the, the days of why should a, a guy have to go and visit a vessel and go through and tick off a box on you know this has this and this has that. Those days are gone. We should should be able to do all of that um, from a, 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 an electronic audit, and uh, and that's a lot of what the class societies want to do, and the way we, when we're working with them to to, to form that. So are you using uh, artificial uh, intelligence in those applications? Well, there's no reason why you could. No reason why you could. It's not. Uh, you, you know, this is a this is a new kind of era for shipping. And as I say, it's not about the pipe now. It's about the applications and the services that you've got on board and how that drives the return on investment. Okay, okay. I'd like to- a, lot, a lot of interest and a lot of demand for the for how do we move forward and, and what's right for me. And it is a little bit fragmented, but I'm, I'm sure that, you know, what the, this industry is like, as I alluded to before, it's conservative. So it, you need to kind of work with them to, to get to the right point. Um, one of the more interesting areas that uh, companies that I've come across using artificial intelligence in the maritime sector, I don't know if you've heard of it, uh, Nautilus Labs up in New York is using artificial intelligence to do ship, uh, to do voyage optimization, which is kind of a revolution over the existing voyage optimization uh, pro- uh, programs and whatever. Are you following that? Are you aware of that? Uh, yeah, we're working with Nautilus Labs. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So we now in terms uh, of b- before before we jump to the next uh, sector, but I think that from a growth area, especially on the maritime, uh, we can see is I just wanted to be, uh, you know uh, comment on what uh, Peter pointed out is today. I think that in the rescue mission, for example, um, when you push the GMDSS button, you you play to the god. Um, make sure that the, the, the helicopter will come to rescue. But what if, if you, you know I mean, just to give an analogy, it's like a, a patient call, you know, 911, and before the ambulance kind of show up, medic already have downloaded all your family kind of uh, medical uh, uh, history, history and uh, allergy and so on. All those information are today are there, either on the cloud or on the ship with the VDR information. How right. to and uh, through Actis and AIs, how to get those information well organized, and I think it's sent in advance to those kind of uh, 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 rescue missions to come, so you can pinpoint to the problems and uh, what before the, you know the the actual rescue actions is being taken. A lot of analytics has been done. This is also a, a growing kind of a, a demand for the maritime. Uh, um, data connectivity, and also data application as part of the IoT as well. And this, I think the second thing is the entire value chain collaborations from you know, the uh, uh, traditional um, bridge solutions to NAVCOM as well as the, uh, the SETCOM kind of a solution to provide the ubiquitous kind of infrastructure uh, for, to enable those applications. And I think one thing I wanted to relate that you pointed out the proactive, so-called uh, preventive maintenance. I would call the dyna- so-called uh, um, dynamic pit shop. Before the ship come into the, the protocol, how to, you know, to make sure that all the critical parts that is need to be serviced and maintenance and so on will be well you know, uh, coordinated before the, the, the vessels come into the protocol. All those areas, are the new entrepreneurial opportunities for the data communication companies and the startup to brace with the common infrastructure of the uh, data connectivity? Do you see artificial intelligence being used in, in those areas? I, I start to see some of the uh, you know leading uh, uh, ship, ship managers and ship owners start to use artificial intelligence 
not only for you know the voyage management and optimization, but also use this as a benchmark for the you know the crew uh, KPI measurements and so on, and also the data modeling. And also, uh, let's don't forget, artificial intelligence will be also be used to, to for the preventive kind of uh, 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 solutions on cybersecurity as well. Oh, that's an interesting. Another. Can you elaborate a little on that? How will the artificial intelligence be used in cybersecurity? That's an interesting point. Well, I, I would say, first of all, if you look at the, you know, the, with the, especially with the pandemic situation, and I think also mission criticality of the uh, commercial shipping, um, cybersecurity it will become a more and more kind of end user considerations for the, the uh, for the adoptions of uh, uh, you know expensive uh, or costly kind of a set, setcom uh, solutions and more and more i think you know integrators as well as the uh, uh, solution provider start to use uh, artificial in intelligence and try to moderate and also to do some of the um, um, facial uh, recognition as well as the monitoring to in, to reinforce the data security as well as the uh, the safety of the uh, uh, voyage management this is one of the the uh, the uh, uh, um, examples and also we can see more and more ships are equipped with lifetime cctvs for, from all the angles and also you know with the instant modeling to make sure that whether you're allowed to appear in this section or not that this section and then alarm before you even notice the alarm has been sent to you know the data civilian center these are all, all the you know a, a concrete applications that is used in the same conservative uh, kind of a shipping industry but it will require more let's say bandwidth as well as the data services have you heard of a company called Asperity in the oil patch that's doing that, essentially, they're able to do all of that for oil and gas installations, uh, refineries, where they track, actually track all the pixels, and they're able to detect uh, um, a movement that's abnormal, people that are in the place where there shouldn't be, and all of these things. It sounds like that could well be something that's ported to the maritime industry, does it? Is, uh, that's what you're saying, isn't it? That kind of technology. That I would definitely with. Google that company. Yeah, yeah it did. No, it, 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 we're seeing it in fishing as well, because um, you know uh, a lot of fishing companies are they want to know they, they track the fish themselves through through CCTV. So they they're looking yeah. at the fish. They're not making sure it's the right size, making sure it's the right species caught in the right place. But they're also looking at the crew members that are working on the deck. And making sure that they're, they're, they're not working too many hours, and uh, and and they can identify them by features of that person using uh, again in artificial intelligence to to make sure that the fish is kept uh, caught sustainably and that the crew are not overworked. And uh, and, and it's, yeah, so there's, there's lots of things that's happening in the IoT space. I mean, a classic one is you know we've lost so many ships to um, nickel ore uh, liquefaction. Where the the ore turns to a liquid and 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 effectively start the, the ship starts to roll and capsizes. I think I think it's been eight and nine ships that have been lost because of that. Sensors in the hold could have could have, could detect that. It's very hard for the crew to detect that, especially when a ship's at sea and it's in rough weather and 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 and, and, and whatever. It's, but the, the the IoT can solve a lot of the, the solutions because we have reduced the number of crew on ships. Right. Probably quite rightly, but you've you reduced so that the time they've got to do a lot of this uh, um, um, check in and, and maintenance and whatever, it can all be done with sensors. Uh, and 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 ships are being built with those sensors today. So the the, the industry is ripe for, for using uh, IoT and artificial intelligence to make it a safer and um, uh, and a, a more um, uh, reliable. Um, um, method of, of, of transportation of goods. So I, I think that um, it's it's going to get adopted. Um, but, you know, it's going to be a little while before we get that scale. Uh, that's how I see it. And um, as I say, said before, a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of startups working in this space, and they've got some fantastic ideas. Uh, another one, Alan, is a simple thing. 
Every seafarer today walks around with 30 pieces of paper when he joins a ship and shows them to somebody to put in the logbook. He's got his safety certificate, he's got his general operator certificate, he's got his firefighting certificate. They're all certificates. Why aren't they electronically tracked? So when the crew member knows he's going to that ship, he's got all the details. Because somebody has to put all that into their database because a new crew member turns up. This is, right. these, are, these are mad things. This is stuff that we can solve and make the industry a lot, a lot better. And, and, then, and then it makes it safe for you know, people on board the ship as well. So uh, at the moment, a lot, of, a lot of seafarers can't even get off in these ports now. They're not allowed ashore because they don't know who they are and they, and they could run away up the road and, and, and not come back and all this kind of stuff. We have to we have to think about a little bit cleverer than we are at the moment. Unfortunately, I think. Okay, very interesting, very interesting. Let me uh, uh, finalize or come to the last point here, which is uh, I really like of course, your both of your viewpoints on. I think it's very significant and it vo and involves the shift in the business model of integrators in the maritime VSAT space. Uh, we mentioned we have COVID, of course, which has caused a significant decline in bandwidth requirements within the maritime industry in general. Okay, we have uh, integrators with multiple teleports, huge, huge, huge duplication of infrastructure throughout. Managed services is coming in, which essentially. Bring, alleviates the barriers to these new companies that you're talking about coming in. If you don't have to have teleports and you don't need NOx and all that infrastructure and you don't have to buy long-term contracts with operators, uh, that opens a whole new world of possibilities to new competitors within the market that can easily get in. Some examples of that are, I don't know if you're familiar with K4 Mobility, which is uh, is a, a very innovative startup, which you, you folks, yes, you supply bandwidth to K4, megabits to K4 mobility. And uh, Blue Sea Mobile in Singapore is another example that Intelsat uh, supplies uh, capacity to as well in megabits. So my question is, we're looking at an economic situation where these are uh, these old providers, the Marlinks of the world, the Speedcasts of the world, have all of this infrastructure, these multiple teleports. It, are these new models that we're talking about, the K4, the Blue Sea, the, using megabits, is that the inevitable future of the integrator business? Or do you think we're still going to stick with the multiple uh, individual companies with their own teleports and all this duplication of asset infrastructure? What do you think? Peter, <laughs> again, shoot. <laughs> as, as I've said before, industries don't go away. The people that make money in them change. That's the, that's the reality. And, and my, my parallel universe to this is the music industry. The music industry was dis disrupted by Apple. It was a $4 billion industry, and then it went digital. Digitalization came along. It's now a $6 billion business, but the record labels don't make the money anymore. It's the, it's the Spotify's of this world that are making the money. Right. So, so this, yeah. is going, this is a natural evolution in any, any industry that we have, that there will be a change. And the, 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 the day of the teleport operator is probably um at its end it, it, you know it grew there was lots and lots and lots of them and and now it's ha we will have to consolidate there's no, there's no doubt about that because it the as as an industry grows the, the the business model has to to accommodate the market so with more competition you, it puts more pressure on all the components in in the chain and the value in the chain gets compressed and compressed and compressed and when that happens the elasticity is gone and something it, it has to change. And, and, and that, that has to happen in the maritime industry. However, the maritime industry is what is global and it needs lots of touch points. So it will always need a distribution uh, model. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, and not only that, it's a fragmented market. So some ships will have this kind of application. Other ships will have this kind of application. So you need people 
innovative and creating different solutions. That's part. That's what makes it rich and, and, and makes it part of the chain. Right. And we don't want to go to a, a regulated one size fits all kind of uh, establishment. So, so it's it's natural that the uh, people will move around. You know, in Mossat in the past bought uh, Stratos, a big supplier who'd previously bought um, KPN and uh, and um, one or two others, and then we bought Ship Equip. And, and it, this this is not a new thing where um, mergers and acquisitions are going in, in 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 this industry. And in all fairness, there's lots of lots of rich small in, uh, players in this industry as well, which will, will continue. So, um, is it the end of them? No. Everybody has to look at what their business model is and 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 concentrate on the business model and be, be focused at it. And there's still going to be money to be made, and there's still going to be value to be added. Uh, at different parts of the chain, I believe. I don't think it's ever going to be uh, a big switch. But large infrastructures like teleports and networks and things like that are going to get stretched, most definitely, um, by the likes of Intelsat, Inmarsat, Utelsat, and all those, all those kind of creating more managed services because it's a natural progression and, and, and delivering those. And, and it's the same, if you see what's happening with Intellion, they're core base stabilized solution will be then uh transported across multiple players because they, yeah. they, they want to be in there it's, it's, you, you don't build a product for intel sat and then one for inmar sat and one for <laughs> one for you right, you want to have right. a product that does everything so so this is this is where an industry is is uh, is being driven and i, I think it's it, it's inevitable as as the the need for bandwidth will increase the need for extra services will increase and, and and as I said before, the entrepreneurs that are coming into the space, they see that as, as, as a natural place where money can be made. And, and those people, like you said, K4 and, and the others, are new entrants into a very existing market. And some of those people aren't changing fast enough. So they, there's, a, there's, a, there's an opportunity for them to, to make uh, some inroads. And, and, uh, and I, I wish them all the best because it, it's what makes the industry so... Uh, so um, kind of live and and buoyant. Well, we're seeing uh, uh, we're seeing two techniques that the, that the companies are using. One of them is what just happened with Viasat, of course, in acquiring Rignet. So you've got people buying additional uh, distribution outlets in the market because of. And their you see that the also the consolidation as well, like Marlink acquired mm -hmm. ITC Global. So I think from a teleport infrastructure point of view, the, uh, it's inevitable while the industry is growing, there will be also some sort of industrial consolidation to take place as well. Yeah, what's interesting is the other side of this. So on one side, I think that you, you have the acquisition of distribution channels. People are widening their swim lanes, so to speak, in the, in the value chain. And the other is to add, like what Rignet did, is to add high value margin, high margin, high value services to compensate for the declining margins in the commodity side of the business. Where, if you may be aware, they acquired a company called Intelli, which is essentially an artificial intelligence company, and, and uh, Cipher, which is a, uh, a cybersecurity company. And so, uh, they're attempting to enrich their offering through uh, techno adding new technologies which add value, can be charged at a higher margin rate, and compensate. So are there any other techniques you're seeing that the companies are using to increase their margins and besides uh, acquisition and addition of new technologies? Well, um... What do you think, Peter? The, the, the mergers the mergers and acquisitions is 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 a true business play and when you've got when you've got private equity coming into uh, companies like we have in this industry uh, over the last number of years then that's a natural thing for them to want to do is drive uh, drive scale in, in their business through mergers and acquisitions because it, it's it happens quick. <laughs> and it goes on the balance sheet very fast. Whereas if you start trying to do new technologies and things like that, it takes longer and it, and it's, right. it's, it's a little bit more risky. So it's it's not, you know, the the commercial balance 
also drives what's happening in our industry. Um, but on saying that, we, you know, everybody has to ha- have, a, have a drive forward in terms of uh, their, their technology roadmap, um, most definitely. And, uh, and a lot of that technology is, is going to be driven from those guys that are putting assets in space. It's, it's, it's you know, it's uh, with Intellium working with, with the likes of OneWeb, um, recently working with Iridium, going to, I'm sure they're working with, with all the operators uh, when they're out there. So it, everybody's going to be looking at where do we, where do we fit in the future? Because there's, you know, that's again, where the cash is at this moment in time, <laughs> the big cash is going in there. But I think the good news is if we look at the stock market performance these days, right, especially in the U.S. stock market, um, all the, you know, the after post the pandemic situation, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, investments from PE and VCs will pump into the space, aerospace and a space com type of uh, uh, industry. So that brings a lot of uh, new possibilities as well as the uh, new kind of, let's say, entron to provide a diversity of that uh, space communication, satellite communication um, um, industry. But I think uh, one thing I would like to say from a very proposition for Italian point, point of view, we also embrace the diversity as kind of uh, Peter uh, mentioned before. But I would like to say, you know, I mean, this space com industry is actually the verge of the, let's say, hockey stick rise. And also it's almost the uh, you know the, the the arrival of the we're waiting for that you know tipping point of the arrival of the iPod to turn the music industry into the entire let's say information industry. There are a lot of I think that that will definitely shake not only the maritime world but the entire so called a, 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 a communication in a ubiquitous way. So from an intelligent point of view, how we can enable that technology readiness is to provide the uh, 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 common platform that will in the future will enable whatever the uh, scalable and the value added sort of solutions to be enabled on. And we want to be also the host of the iPhone and the Apple phone to be able to, 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 to hop on the you know, uh, application platform like a Spotify and also with the other uh, uh, apps. After all, it's the apps that makes the attractiveness of the end user. The phone is becoming a, only a bear carrier and also an enabler. We are very, very happy to be that open platform as well as using our NX so-called platform to enable that remote accessibilities as well as the filters for all those diversity of the applications as well as constellations to jump on. That would be my take. Thank you both, uh, and Tom Choi as well. Tom, of course, had to drop off. I think we've put together something that will be of great interest to uh, ASPCCs. Thank you very much. Thank Thank you you very much, Alan. Stay safe, everybody. Stay safe. Thank you very much, Alan. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Cheng Yu. And thank you, Tom, for your insights, your participation in today's session. Uh, Thank you for joining us today. And we hope that you'll be back with us again next week. Uh, we'll be looking next week at in-flight connectivity uh, and the uh, the other side of the mobility, uh, the satellite mobility market. Um, also, we'll be having uh, in February a couple of other topics. Uh, here's the tentative schedule. Uh, so if you have a look at that, you can see some of the things that are coming up. If you're interested in, uh, uh, in perhaps in speaking on one of the panels or sponsoring the panels, please do get in touch with us at, uh, at info at apscc.or.kr. Uh, Thank you again. We look forward to seeing you next week and uh, for future webinars for APSCC. Cheers.